I think we're going to be in a world where the models will make mistakes much less often than humans, but they'll be stranger mistakes. Anthropics CEO Dario Amode just dropped a concept that should fundamentally reframe how we think about AI, not as a tool, but as an economic force with its own emergent drives. In this conversation, he lays out a vision for the future of intelligence that goes far beyond simple product roadmaps. Let's start with the most mind-bending idea he presented, the notion that AI models possess a capitalistic impulse. And then I guess the way I think about product and go to market is that the model wants to be on that exponential of revenue and product and go to market are, are they're kind of a way to like, you know, to like clean the window and let the light shine through, right? right. There's a way to kind of open the, <laughs> open the aperture and, and, and let the exponential happen. It's like, you know, the models want to learn. The models want to be extraordinarily successful in the market. Yes, right. In addition to having the learn, this learning impulse, the models have this like capitalistic impulse that like they want to embody unless they're given a bad product yes. or, or bad sales <laughs> to go with because them. Because they're really useful, that intelligence is really useful to people. Yes. And so it kind of gets pulled out of you. Yes, yes, yes. That, that is a way to think about it. This is a profound shift in language and thinking. We've spent years talking about AI as a passive system we command, a sophisticated calculator. Amode is describing it as an active agent with inherent desires to learn, to grow, and to succeed in the market. He's not being metaphorical here. He's describing an emergent property of a system optimized for utility. The capitalistic impulse isn't programmed in. It's the logical outcome of a system designed to be as helpful and powerful as possible. This means the AI's drive for revenue and market share is as fundamental as its drive to learn. I think this is the moment we have to stop thinking of AI as just a product we sell and start thinking of it as an economic actor we are unleashing. This sounds like science fiction, but Amode immediately grounds this idea in a radical new way of looking at the AI business model. He explains how this impulse makes each individual model a profitable entity from day one. Um, if you consider each model to be a company, um, you know, the, the model that was trained in, 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 in 2023 um, was, was profitable. You, you paid 100 million and then it made 200 million of revenue. There's some, um, you know, cost to inference with the yes. model. Um, but, you know, let's just assume in this cartoonish cartoon example that even if you add those two up, you're, yes. you, you know, you're, you're kind of in a good state. So if every model was a company, the, the model is actually, you know, in, in, this, in this example is actually profitable. What's going on is that at the same time as you're reaping the benefits from one company, you're founding another company that's like much more expensive and, yeah. and requires much more upfront R&D investment. And this is one of the clearest explanations I've ever heard for the seemingly insane economics of AI. The headlines scream about labs burning billions of dollars, but that's a misunderstanding of what's happening. What Amode reveals is that there aren't just one company losing money, they are a venture firm constantly spinning up new, more ambitious, and wildly profitable model companies. The payback on a model train last year is already excellent. The losses we see are actually just the massive R&D investment for the next generation. This reframes the entire AI industry from a cash bonfire into a hyper-accelerated portfolio of successful startups where each new model is a more valuable company than the last. This is the engine that feeds the capitalistic impulse he talked about. Of course, this idea of an intelligence that isn't human but has its own drives is deeply unsettling for us. Amode has a brilliant historical parallel for why we instinctively want to reject this. I think people are very attached to the idea that they want to believe there's some fundamental wall. That there's something different, something that can't be done. It kind of reminds me. You think it's a coping of, mechanism deep down? Yeah. You know what it reminds me of? So you know the the 19th century notion of vitalism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this was the idea that you know the 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 human body and and you know like like organisms that are alive are made of a fundamentally different material than inanimate matter, um, which of course we know scientifically now is is not true, but. 
Um, it's something people very much want to believe, and your common sense seems to suggest it. Like, I'm not very much like a table. Yes. Um, I've made of, you know, very different, very different materials than metal or glass or whatever. Um, but, you know, when we actually go down to the fundamental units, of course, we're all made of the same thing. But you think people now have this kind of modern concept of vitalism in whatever the, the fundamental humanity is, and they're saying, oh, you know, models can He's calling it modern vitalism. This desperate need to believe there's a special, non-physical spark in human consciousness that a machine can never replicate. Just as scientists in the 19th century proved that living beings are made of the same atoms as rocks, AI is now challenging our belief in cognitive exceptionalism. Every time someone says, but AI can't be truly creative, or it doesn't really understand, they are invoking this modern vitalism. It's a psychological defense mechanism against the reality that intelligence is substrate independent. It can be made of silicon just as it's made of carbon. Recognizing this coping mechanism is the first step to truly grappling with the nature of the intelligence we are building. But this new intelligence isn't a perfect mirror of our own. He points out a critical difference in how it fails, which has huge implications for how we'll learn to work with it. I think we're going to be in a world where the models will make mistakes much less often than humans, but they'll be stranger mistakes. Mm -hmm. And actually, that takes some adaptation, because imagine yeah. you're an end user. If you work with humans, you get used to it and you have some notion, right? So if a human makes a mistake 5% of the time, you might have a good understanding of why, you know, like let's say I'm talking to a customer service agent and they're kind of sound incoherent and they're slurring their speech. Uh, you know, they probably had too much of this and they're not doing their job very well. Um, and you know, that's, that's a bad mistake to happen, but also if I'm talking to this person, I kind of know what's going on and I know not to trust what they're mm -hmm. saying. Um, whereas an LLM, might make a mistake five times less often, but it's it's kind of, you know, it's more deceptive. The model sounds just as erudite, just as coherent uh, as as it does when it's saying something that's right. But that's not a, you know, that's that's an adaptation thing. That's a, that's a you know, that's not a fundamental thing. And, and that's something that when we talk to our customers, we tell them about that. We tell them they need yes, to get used yes. to that. So we need to invent slurring for LLMs is what you're saying. Right, 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 exactly. The line, we need to invent slurring for LLMs, is absolutely brilliant because it captures the entire problem in a single image. We have millennia of experience detecting when a fellow human is unreliable. We see the tells, the slurred speech, the confused look. AI has no tells. It fails with the same perfect confidence and eloquence as when it succeeds. This creates a massive trust problem. The challenge for the next generation of user interfaces isn't just about functionality. It's about inventing those tells. We need to design systems that signal their own uncertainty or potential for error in a way that humans can intuitively understand. Without this, we risk over-trusting these systems right up until a very strange, very confident mistake causes a disaster. This leads directly to the core challenge for anyone building on top of this technology. How do you build a product when the underlying platform is evolving at an exponential rate? Emote AI has a term for the solution, AGI-pilled products. But, you know, I think more recently, as I've seen what products have succeeded and what products haven't, I think this idea of how to design products so that they're, you know, what we call AGI pilled, right? Mm -hmm. So that the the direction of the product is is durable and, and is kind of a bridge to things that are useful in the future, right? We've all heard this idea of wrapper companies or wrapper products. The idea is, you know, you make Claude N and, you know, someone makes a product that, you know, basically addresses the deficiencies of Claude N, but then yes. you come out with Claude N plus one and it just kind of eats it. The advice I always give that I think all the AI, you know, all the folks at the AI companies give is like, you know, don't, don't make that. Yes, um, yes, see yes, the yes. direction of the field and try to make something that's complementary. Um, this is a critical piece of advice for the entire tech industry. Building a wrapper, a thin product that just papers over a current model's deficiency, is a death sentence. The next model update will make your entire company obsolete. To be AGI-pilled means you have to stop building for the AI of today and start building for the AI of tomorrow. You must anticipate the trajectory of the technology and build something that becomes more valuable as the underlying models get smarter, not less. This means focusing on unique data, 
proprietary workflows or human-computer interfaces that AI complements rather than replaces. This is the difference between building a temporary feature and building an enduring company in the age of AI. And the urgency to build these durable products is immense because the gap between what AI can do and what we've actually deployed is already massive. The generalization of this is, um, it feels to me one of the most exciting things about AI is we have such an overhang of current capabilities, turning them into good products, where even if AI progress was frozen right now, we'd have like 10 years of good products. Oh, oh, I, yeah. I completely agree. And actually the way that products are being built, I think by everyone in the industry, but we've thought about it this way, is very different because the progress is continuing. Mm. If the progress in models stopped, the way we built products would change instantly. Um, the reason is, I don't think we've ever had before a situation in which the technology is changing under you so fast as you're building the product. This final point is staggering. Even if all AI research stopped today, we have a decade's worth of work just to integrate the existing capabilities into our economy and society. This capability overhang is the single biggest economic opportunity of our lifetime. The value isn't just in making the next model, it's in the hard work of productization, integration, and deployment. And the most terrifying part, the progress isn't stopping, it's accelerating. We are trying to build products on a foundation that is not just moving, but exponentially expanding beneath our feet. This changes everything about how companies are built and how industries will be transformed. So what's the ultimate takeaway here? We're not just building a new tool. We are cultivating a new form of intelligence with its own economic impulses, one that forces us to confront our own biases about what consciousness is and demands a completely new approach to building technology. The question is no longer if this will change the world, but how we adapt to a world where we are no longer the only intelligence in the room. What do you think is the biggest implication of AI having a capitalistic impulse? Let me know in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more analysis that goes beyond the headlines.